this is a this is a paleontological field trip to Nootka Island on the west coast of Nootka Island and to the north end of Nootka Island. And um, we're actually following it in the footsteps of the Geological Survey of Canada. Um, we've done research on several scientific papers to, uh, to zero in on locations and to uh, get to this area is not easy. I can tell you that right now. So that fossil you see there on the top is one that Betty Franklin found. It's a Magocus, and uh, it has the very large eye sockets, as you can see up there, right in here. And so it's very easy to identify. It has two little horns on each side like this, and of course, eight legs and two pinchers. So it's a, it's a fairly common crab that we find, um, Escalante and, and different locations. but. Uh, at Nootka Island, uh, it's actually not the dominant species. So um, it's the Renitid crabs that seem to be dominant. Okay, so for a field trip like this takes a lot of planning. And um, this is our team. Um, we have Charity and Patty. Hi, Patty. Is, I don't know if Charity on as well? Maybe not. Uh, there's John right here. Look at the size of that pack. Um, there's myself, uh, Dan and Betty Franklin, uh, Jay and Amy, uh, James Wood, uh, and uh, Mike Trask. So that was our, our team of, I think it was nine or 10 people. And um, we, uh, we had an awesome trip. So this, this trip is not just paleontological, as I said at the beginning, it's also um, an adventure, it's hiking, it's camping out, it's taking photography or taking great uh, pictures and also the camaraderie of being with friends that uh, like to dig for fossils. So in order to, to understand how to do this type of a trip, um, we do a lot of research and this, this uh, this, the, the Canadian Journal of Earth Sciences in 1973 by Jeletsky was one of the key uh, uh, papers that we had to study. And of course, it's, it's uh, the discussion in there of tertiary rocks. And tertiary rocks are, you know, oligocene, uh, eocene um, time period uh, where we are looking, we're looking for those, that age of rocks and there's specific species in those rocks. And this oak crop on the west coast of Vancouver is one of the most extensive in all of Canada um, for marine fossils. So it's pretty unique. And this is other papers we've, we've read as Jeletsky, uh, 1954, 73, and uh, Cameron, 1971 and 72, and Weaver, 1944 and 1963. So a lot of research goes into uh, uh, a field trip. So um, just a second here, I'll just put that back. Okay, so this is an example of uh, the papers that were done. If you look at the top corner, we see if you're gonna follow on the west coast of Vancouver Island from the north, Nootka Island, we go to the Hesquiet Peninsula, that was Jeletsky, Nootka Island, Hesquiet Peninsula was Cameron, Carmana Point, Clapp, Cook, Clark, Arnold, uh, Souk as well. And you work your way all down uh, to Washington State where the Olympic Peninsula is and the papers have been done there. And the reason I'm, I put this in here is I want people to know that that same tertiary exposure occurs on west west coast of, of uh, Washington, and John and myself and Jean Sibold and others have been down on those sites uh, as well. And so that's just to show you how much studying has been going on. And of course, um, you break down the groups from the Souk Formation, Carmana Group, um, etc. So. I will, I'll jump ahead. So in that Journal of, of Science, 
we found this page, which we zeroed right in on. And figure one, although these specimens are not as nice as ours, of course, because they just look like they just smashed them out with not too much care. We take really, really careful, uh, we're really care careful with it. So um, we zero in here. This was uh, Xanthopsis vulgaris, um, which was found on the west coast of Nook Island. It's now been renamed to Polalis vulgaris. So this is another thing that the species names change. And once you learn it one way, it's you have to sometimes relearn it uh, a different way. Uh, what we used to call Porcinitis alexensis uh, is now called Magocus alexensis. And uh, Microsina nasalensis used to be that long word right there. So the, the, the names have all been changed because the this was described, some of these were described in the 1926. So since then, more species have been discovered and, um, and uh, they've update, up, uh, re revised their, their nomenclature. So not only is there crabs, but there's bivalves and there's gastropods. So I won't name these gastropods, but this, this is what, what you can find as well. Okay, if you want to go on a trip like this, be prepared to travel. So to go from Courtney or from anywhere on Vancouver Island, uh, you drive to Tassus. Okay, now I don't know how many people have ever been to Tassus, probably not too many. Um, this is when where we would, uh, we got in the boat uh, called the uh, Shorebird Tours, and we get in that boat, and you'll see a picture of that boat. And we have to meet them at seven o'clock in the morning. So that means we have to go up there, camp overnight, get up early in the morning, have breakfast, jump in the boat, and away we go. And we boat comes down to this this connection that goes out to um, Cayucat Inlet. We go out Cayucat Inlet to the west coast, cut through the Nuchalith group of islands, which is a marine park. And we land right here at Tongue Point. So that's the, the, the strategy we set up for this trip. Um, I throw this picture in because Duchalnus is a First Nations area which was really quite protected from the, from the waves because it's a bunch of little islands. So we cut through the islands here, um, a shortcut to come down to Tongue Point. And I'll mention that because I'm gonna talk about what happened when we cut through that shortcut. Um, so when we arrive at Tongue Point, we get off, get our packs, and we hike down the shoreline of Louis Bay. The tide was out, so we actually walked right down the middle of this to this secret spot here, which we had a hard time finding. Then we go inland up a rope ladder, and we come over to what's called Third Beach, or what some people call First Beach, and that's where our, our, we camped. Okay, here's the, the Motley crew. Um, we're in Tassus, and uh, we're at the marina, and uh, we're we've in the boat, all our gears in the boat, and we're ready to, to go. Um, so here, here's a little summary of our group, myself, um, Charity, Betty, Mike, Betty, Mike, yeah, they're all here, uh, Amy, etc. So that's our, our group. And away we go and we head out. It's a beautiful day. The weather's fantastic. There's hardly any wind, there's hardly any waves. And we're on the west coast of Vancouver Island. And we, we're coming into this new Chalnet, new Chatlets, Marine Park that I was mentioning before. And all of a sudden we realize that it's really shallow and the captain of the boat had, had, was breaking in a new gal to, uh, to run the boat to spare him off, eh? And, uh, and so she wasn't um, perhaps, that, perhaps that skilled and we ran into this eelgrass bed of, and kelp 
and we got high centered right in the middle of the ocean. We couldn't go ahead or back. We were stuck. And uh, luckily it wasn't stormy or anything like that, but it, we were, we took us about maybe you know, 15 or 20 minutes of pushing around with it with a, with a pole and trying to adjust ourselves to get out of this kelp bed. So it was kind of our, our first little adventure of, uh oh. <laughs> However, while we were there, it was the most beautiful place to be. We took time to take a few pictures. And uh, here's, I mean, basically it's just the west coast of Vancouver Island is most beautiful time. So a few more pictures of the kelp as we were stuck there. Finally, we got ourselves loose and we had to go across a open water to get to Tongue Point. And that arrow you see is, uh, is our landing spot right here. And this is where the boat's gonna come in and drop us off. Um, yeah, there we are looking in anticipation. So what we found out was right here is a house. This is a, a church uh, campground where um, the church would bring kids out for their um, uh, wilderness experience, I guess. And so we, we were able to um, kind of have a place to start out from and, and we camped here overnight and uh, we were uh, ready to go in the morning. So in the morning, we uh, go out on the beach and of course, what do we find? We realize that we're not alone. There's bear, bear foot, bear prints in the sand. There's wolf prints. It's just crawling with wildlife here. I don't hope you can all see those, that wolf print. They're pretty neat. And uh, so this is our day started off with great excitement. And uh, yeah, we're hoping to see some wolves and some bears, but we didn't see any wolves on this trip. So right when you start off from Tongue Point, you go down the inlet and there's a boat wreck in there that's completely blown apart. I'm not sure what the story is behind it, but it was a big ship that I think it's sunk off the West Coast and they pulled it in here and, and blew it up and it's just basically rusting away. And uh, there is some more parts of it. So this is just us starting off that morning, uh, the next, uh, second morning, I should say, and we're, we're packing up to start our hike. So we would go down um, Louis Bay and we are hiking through good ground on the right-hand side and muddy ground on the left-hand side. And uh, it's not a bad hike. It's probably a couple of kilometers uh, of walking along this, this uh, shoreline. It's actually an inlet. And um, we're heading out and on the right-hand side, that's Patty and myself. And if you go beyond those rocks, you've gone too far. And so we backed up a little bit and we found a rope. And the, the rope is the only thing that tells you there's a trail there because there is no trail. Really, really no, not much of a trail. Here's some more images of that hike in. So there's the rope. Now, it's not a very big rope. It's not a, somebody has put it there and that's the trail. And we, it's really easy to walk by it and missed it. I think Patty and I walked right by it. But then when you get up into the forest, this is the trail you hike in on. So it's, it's rough. And of course it's over logs, under logs, through the forest and, uh, it's pretty, um, it's pretty rough, especially with a full pack on. However, we broke out in the beach at one point to this little island that the tide has come around and there's this rock monument here with this giant Sitka spruce on it that's been literally converted to a bonsai tree. So we, we call this bonsai beach. And it, it's 
pretty spectacular to see it. This bottom part right here is a giant burl, uh, a big massive burl that's locked into solid rock. And this tree is growing out of that. It's just a special tree, if you like trees. I love bonsai trees, so it's pretty, pretty neat. And of course, these little tidal pools here are pretty, pretty uh, photogenic, as you can see. Here's Betty Franklin. Uh, she's one of our, she's our, uh, our uh, treasurer for the VIPS. And she's pretty well on every trip we go on. Great hiker. Um, we have James and Jay here uh, checking our maps. Um, and we have, of course, our safety walkie talkies to talk back and forth with each other. So we're, we want to keep together, but sometimes if you're separated, we want to have uh, contact. And of course, when you're hiking the beach, you look for these little floats hanging in a tree. That means you walk the, the beach and the trail goes in here. So you go up in around this headland. Now, this is a, a headland that you can't get around because there's the ocean is right there. So you have to go inland around the headland. And finally, we get to Third Beach. So this is our destination on day one to get to this beach and set up our camp. Of course, it's beautiful, sandy beach. The sun, sun was out, it was great weather. We set up our camp and uh, you can see that uh, we uh, were ready to, we, we set up our camp and we set up for our, our supper. And uh, there's Betty and Amy and Mike and uh, getting prepared. We have, our, we have our, our stoves out. Of course, we have small stoves to backpacking stoves and pots and that to cook our supper. And this is our camp. Any questions so far? Good. Can I everybody? Have a question. Oh, go ahead. So I saw the island chains as you were pulling up to uh, Nuchatlitz. Nuchatlitz. Yeah. Nuchatlitz. Yeah. I I really need to work on my pronunciation. Um, why are there so many small, shallow island formations? Whereas if you go more east to Vancouver Island, it's all really just singular large rocks. I just think it's the, the geology and the erosion factor on the west coast. It's, it's rugged, very rugged. It's tertiary rock. Um, it seems to erode in, there's areas where there's actually uh, spires that stick up um, 20 or 30 feet. Um, and you don't see that at all on the east coast of Vancouver Island. So it's the, it's the geology is just spectacular. Um, and the, the west coast carves out out of the sedimentary rock. It carves caves, it carves um, spires and these islands as well. So, it's just it's just the way that, that the West Coast is. Okay, here's some more uh, pictures of our campfire. Um, again, we're all together. We have our, you can see that we have our, just for, for example, this here is a water filtering system that we have. We take that water, any water we get is filtered. And so to protect us from Jardia, most of these little streams have may have uh, Jardia, um, which is beaver fever, which you don't ever want to get. So we're really careful about our water supply. And everybody must have a good water supply and, and uh, uh, water filtration system. So from our campsite, this is our beautiful sunset day here. Um, again, this is a type of scenery we have. Um, and it's, it's pretty pretty neat, yeah. And of course, uh, evening, we have the campfire going, it's all um, fun. And um, also, uh, this is, I think, from the second night, I've put this in here, 
Um, we do have the uh, exotic foods. And Patty brought this, hey, what was this called again? The, it's a. That was uh, nan bread to go with the chicken curry, I believe. Yeah, that's nan bread. And we had, uh, this is a, a, um, a mushroom called uh, chicken of the woods. Oh, right, yeah. And we, we picked that and we cooked it up. And so uh, we're, we, that's a pretty safe uh, uh, mushroom to eat, by the way. So we all, we all were safe with that. But this is kind of a experiment. We don't do this all the time, but it was just kind of a, a fun thing we did. And here's a, 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 a threesome here that's kind of a scary. That's uh, Jay Hawley, who's, who's our famous fossil preparator, myself and John. Um, of course, you all know John. Um, he was, he's also uh, uh, been with the VIPS for many, many years. And he was on some of our very first field trips when he was like, I don't know, were you 14, John? Yeah, I think he was about 14 years old when he first went to uh, uh, Cayucat on the first trip. Okay, how do we know where to go? Okay, well, in that, that research paper I showed at the very beginning, um, I went to that paper and everything on that paper was measured from Farrier Point. And it said, Four kilometers south of Farrier Point, there's an outcrop. 4.8 kilometers, an outcrop. Five kilometers, six kilometers. And so I went on the Google Earth and I measured out every one of them from Farrier Point. This is a long way. And I discovered these locations. And that's how, this is uh, my map that I've, I've made up. So of course, F means fossils. That's creek number one, creek number two, creek number three, and Schooner Bay, and uh, Calvin Falls, and Bajo Point. We didn't go as far as Bajo. Betty went far as, as far as Calvin, and the rest of us just went in this area. So that's kind of the, the, the understanding. And of course, this is all the Hesquiet formation of tertiary rocks. So that's uh, Eocene Oligocene. And that's, uh, again, um, um, what you have to study up on and, and understand how that works. Okay, day one, we're ready to go fossiling. Okay, so we're all excited to get out of third beach or first beach, we call it. We have to leave at low tide to get around this rock outcrop. This is key information. If you don't do this early in the morning while the tide is low, you have a torturous route over top, which is way back this way, up a rope ladder and around, which takes about half an hour to get over straight to here. So this just takes about 10 minutes. So um, away we go. So once we get down to Creek One, um, we start finding concretions. Uh, I'm sure everybody knows what a concretion is, but um, these concretions here are formed in and around any organic matter. Could be wood, could be bone, could be a uh, crab, or it could be a bivalve, um, and, uh, or it could be a fossil cone, uh, like a cone from a coniferous tree. And so we collect them up like this, and we, of course we crack them in half to see what's inside them. And what do we find fairly quickly? We found this is a carapace of a crab. It's not the best specimen, but that was fairly early on in our, our collecting. Pincher and pincher still in the rock, some legs. Um, and here's another one over here. And th so this is the kind of thing we start finding right away. Um, Amy found this cone right here. And uh, the cone was split right in half. And there's some seeds. They're crystallized and still in, in the cone. So this is kind of a pretty exciting find because we do find cones at Escalante 
um, south of Gold River. So that's uh, um, now we don't know what species this is. So this has got to be um, a thin section has got to be done on this, and it's we have to analyze it under the microscope to see the cellular cellular uh, makeup of this cone, and then we can determine what species it is, or at least what uh, genera it is, um, if it's a pine cone or or some other different type of cone. Cone. So further down the beach, we find um, I'm just working on a on something here, I'm not sure what it is. I think it might be a, a large scaphlopod. Um, and uh, looks like um, James and Jay are ahead going up to the next spot. Okay, there's a, I'm not quite sure what that one is. I think it might be a polalis. Yeah, it's not a, the best specimen. It's kind of been munched up and broken, but that's sometimes you have some good cracks and sometimes you don't. So it's good to realize there's good and bad when you have your cracks, uh, your cracking concretions. And again, we're all, we find one, we, we talk about it, we share the information and yeah, this is a Palalis, no, this is a Magocus or, or whatever. Um, there's Charity. I don't know if she's on today, but uh, she might not have been able to log on, I don't know. I'm Anyways, here. Are you there? I'm here. Oh, good. Okay. Hi. Anyways, uh, we're looking at a, a fossil crab here. I think this is a renitid crab. Um, it, it's uh, renitid crabs. I'll talk more about renitid crabs uh, later, and uh, because they're quite different than a normal crab, um, they and we'll I'll mention I'll talk about it later. It's a, I got a special slide for that. Um, this crab here, I'm not sure what it is. It looks like a Magocus crab. And again, it's not the best specimen, but again, that's early. We're, we're, this is in the field cracking concretions. And here's another one that's not that good a specimen. However, look at this. This is a Palalis vulgaris that Patty found. Can you see that, Patty? Yes, I sure do. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it hasn't been prepped out yet. However, what you're seeing here is the mold. Sorry, the uh, no, it's the uh, cast, uh, and the shell is missing on this. However, what we'll do is we'll take both right sides. This is on, this, on the right-hand side is the cast. On the left-hand side is the mold. It's really hard to see, but this side here will be glued back onto this side over here and we'll prep down and the shell will now be on this will we'll be glued on there like we'll, the yeah. shell is there you yeah. can see that white line that's yeah. the shell right yeah mm -hmm. the white shell is, is all here and it's going to be glued onto this and so it's going to be um put together so we've already glued this together we just haven't had jay uh, over to do the prep on it so we're, we're very excited about this being a, such a, a high quality specimen of pulalis vulgaris and they're quite rare in this on Vancouver Island. So um, at least in the there's none at Escalante and uh, other sites we've been to. Yeah, I'm very excited about that one. It's just a little bit smaller than my hand. Yeah, yeah, it's it's quite big. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty big. Yeah. So other uh, things that we find in this area, the first area was uh, um, some bivalves. And this is a scallop shell. So it's a kind of late Eocene, early Oligocene. Um, that's the time period. Uh, Hesquip formation, Nook Island. And um, we don't find a whole lot of these scallop shells. Down in Washington State, though, uh, in the Lincoln Formation, they find lots of scallop shells. And so there's some 
comparisons between these two sites that we're interested in, in following through on. Other things we're finding is, of course, uh, gastropods. It's a Turatella gastropod. Um, not that common, but we found it, saw a couple. This isn't, wasn't, we didn't take this out because it was, uh, it, it, it was already worn down quite a bit. Uh, we find uh, scaphlopods. Now, I don't, I'll put that up a little bit higher. So at the very bottom of the, of the page, you can see that scaphlopod is quite long. Um, it's over 10 centimeters, which is five inches. So this is quite a big scaphlopod. And it has, it's almost a perfect specimen. It has the, the detail of the attachment right here um, for the living part of the scaphlopod. And so it's kind of a, uh, it, for some people, it's fairly common. I like to collect them because they're it's such a perfect specimen. So it looks like I might have just taken this out in one piece. Well, guess what? It's broken there, 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 and there. I had to glue this thing together in uh, about five different pieces, but when you get it all together, you can see what a fantastic specimen it is. I'm just gonna move this picture it's over here. Okay, Dan, you're on mute. <laughs> I muted myself. Okay, darn, I hate that. Okay, resume. That's what happens when I mess around. Okay, back to, can you hear me now? Yep, you're good. Okay. Okay, this is our, this is our lunchtime on the trail. We have to have to pack a lunch every day, of course, and because we're gone for the whole day. Uh, so we, we uh, have to carry our own water and our own food. And we're about maybe two hours from our camp right here. And we return that day. And because the tide is in, remember I mentioned the headland, we had to go up over the headland. And, and this is not a nice trail. Uh, you can see that it's muddy, it's uh, windfalls across it. So we're up and over and around. And it's a pain because we're loaded up with fossils and we're tired. But uh, this is the only way back to camp. Um, yeah, not a very pretty trail, as you can see on the left-hand side there. Um, on the right-hand side, we get to the end of the headland and we come down the rope uh, to the beach that has our camp on. There's John Pham um, coming down the, the rope with his booty, with his fossils. Um, again, along our our trail, our hike in, I've, I've got a few images here to show you the, um, what we have to climb over. So on the, on the right here, uh, this is the trail right here. And we have to climb up this route and over this log and down. So it's a brutal trail coming in, but beautiful. Um, I'm gonna convert from paleontology to botany for a little bit. And uh, Amy uh, was our official photographer on the, uh, on the field trip. And she got some fantastic images of some species that I have no idea what they are. That little blue mushroom, I had never seen one before in my life. So that's pretty neat. We also got some great photographs. This is the artsy side of this presentation of eelgrass in the sun kelp, um, 
on the beach um, laid out. Um, right near our camp was this cave. We went inside to explore it. And uh, Amy got a great shot looking out, or maybe it was, um, I don't know who took that picture, as, as well as looking up at the trees. And of course, our sunset, which we, we talked about already. OK, I'm going to do a little bit of education here for any of you that don't know what a renitid crab is. Um, so a renitid crab, uh, where we find the, the, the Eocene, Oligocene fossil crabs that are renitid crabs. And they're from the same family, renididae. And that family um, uh, is alive today, as I said. And these are two examples of renitid crabs that are alive today. And they, they like uh, warm water. So they're down in the, in, in the uh, South China Sea and uh, Philippine Islands and places like that. And they call them the frog crab. And if you Google this, you can learn all about frog crabs. The reason they call them a frog crab is they actually sit up on a rock, a rock just like a, a frog would sit. Now, if you look at a frog on a rock, they kind of have, they're sitting down with their, their nose sticking up, right? Well, that's exactly how these renitid crabs um, sit in, in, in real life today. So Patty, Patty's first renitid fossil crab. So this is pretty exciting for Patty. Mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, it's, it doesn't have any legs because it's a molt. So now you all know that crabs grow bigger from little crabs to larger crabs. And as they grow bigger, they molt. They shed their shell and they grow into a bigger shell. And then they shell, shed their crowd, shell and they grow into a bigger shell. So what we're finding here is the molt of a crab. And uh, so this one happens to have the features, two large spines, as you can see. And uh, Jay was able to prep this out really well. These are called horns across here. And you've got to be so careful prepping these out. This is one larger, a medium, a small, and a large. And so this is, and they're symmetrical. And we have the other spine on the other side. And this is kind of a, a dappled, uh, a bumpy um, shell. So very exciting for Patty's first renitid crab. It's Microcenia nasalensians. So it's uh, uh, a crab that uh, we, we all found one of these uh, and it's very exciting to find this high quality specimen like this. Um, this is uh, a crab that I found not on this trip. It was from the Escalante, but I wanted to put it in because we're talking about renitid crabs. So this is quite a large crab and it has the horns on the front are completely, totally different. And the claws, these are claws here, are quite different than a normal crab. They all have kind of sharp horns on the shells, on the, uh, on the side of the, of the pincher. And it's like little pairs of scissors and they close like scissors. So they, can, they literally can cut things. Uh, and uh, so uh, renitid crabs are really highly sought after by uh, people that collect crab fossils. Uh, Jay Hawley got a little bit excited here. <laughs> Anyways, he's preparing one of his um, um, fossil Pulalis uh, vulgaris, and it's a big crab. And it's, it's either in our shop here, but behind my house, I got a shop and we prepare the fossils. We have tools. Um, this is a arrow with an inch and a half stylus. And we can get into those hard to reach places. And we prep out the fossils um, that are good ones like this. And this is a close up of that um, Pulalis. Um, so what we do is we prep down right in the middle of the crab, find the carapace, 
and then we work out with the tools to get to the legs. We prep the legs out, and we work on the on the pinchers. And uh, this is really a spectacular specimen, although we're, it's missing one leg on the side. But there, there it is, right there underneath. So uh, and it's got four on this side, which is um, uh, uh, decapods uh, have four legs and two pinchers, and that's what makes them a deca, meaning 10. And here's, uh, I'm not sure if that's the same one. I think it is, yeah, it is. So one feature I wanna point out here is this little feature right here. This is an eye socket from a crab. And this one here, of course, is missing. However, this is the detail that we take. This would maybe take six hours to prep this out like this. This is a dedication to get this to this stage and, and quite quite difficult. And not, for, not everybody can do this, but we're all trying to be as good as Jay. <laughs> of course, this is an, uh, another Pulalis that Jay prepped out. Um, and this is even more spectacular because what he was able to do is prep out the leg and the actual claw on the very end. This one here goes out and bends down into the rock and he was able to prepare that. This one comes out and down into the rock. And so he was able to, to uh, prepare this out. Pinchers are good. Um, the, the dappling on the shell is fantastic. So what a, what a, a specimen um, and what a, a good job preparing. And this all came from Nootka Island from our, from our trip. Here's another one, the very first one I showed you. It was, this is one of Betty's and this is a Magocus. And uh, the legs actually went right outside the concretion on this one. So you see kind of these ones here are cut off. But what you can see is detail like this. This hind leg of this crab actually has a flipper on it. And these crabs could actually swim. So that's kind of a, a feature that you don't want to miss on a crab. These are swimmers. And uh, this is our, I think our third day or fourth day, I'm not quite sure. And we made it all the way down to Schooner Bay. and. Uh, uh, and we had some uh, great collection there. Um, this was a site where a whale had washed up years ago. So we actually found ribs and vertebrae from that whale. Um, although we were loaded up with fossils, we couldn't even carry a vertebrae out, except Betty, she, she did. And uh, so that's our group. You recognize Patty, James and Jay. And we're stopping for our lunch. And while we're having lunch, we met this group of, of tough looking hikers, uh, very intrepid because they were doing the entire Nootka Trail, which is the toughest trail on Vancouver Island to do. It's more difficult than the West Coast Trail or the um, Cape Scott Trail because they're in places there is no trail. Uh, and it's just really uh, the ultimate in hiking. So we, we told them what we we're doing and James, uh, being the generous guy that he is, um, they asked what we we're doing. We said we're collecting fossils. So James shared uh, one of his fossils with that young boy there. Um, and he could take that back to Holland or the Netherlands, I should say. And, uh, and he ha would have a, a show and tell thing for, for his class at school. So while we're down there, oops, sorry. While we're at that south end, we collected too many fossils. Literally, it was that sad. We were not able to carry them out. So we decided to put them into some bags and hide them behind that log where that arrow is and hope that someday we could come back and get them. I do have a friend who has a float plane 
and he, he has a, also a little beach aircraft that he can land on the beach with his big tires. And he went in to see if he could find this. I showed him where it was, but he couldn't find them. He went in twice and couldn't find them. And uh, finally, I had to send him this picture with this arrow <laughs> saying it's right there, but I'd cover that up with some driftwood so nobody would find them. He said, oh, now you tell me. Anyways, he did find them and he got them all out for us. It took us about four months or five months before we finally got them, but we got, got them all back and everybody got their fossils. So moving along to something very exciting because we found something that's never been found ever in British Columbia. And uh, James Wood came over, cracked it over and says, Dan, what's this? And I looked at it and says, I have no idea. I have no idea what it is. It, is it part of a crab? I don't think so. Is it a new species of crab? I don't know. So when we got back, we shared it with some friends and uh, John did some research as well. And we realized it was an isopod. And I knew nothing about what an isopod was. Of course, I've heard of the word isopod. I know that, you know, like sow bugs are, uh, are related to isopods, but they're on the land. This is an isopod from the marine environment. And so we started doing some research as we always do. And we pulled up a paper from, I think, John, did you send that up or did, did Tori? Are you there, John? Anyways, hey Dan, yeah, I know I, I showed it the picture to Tori and then um, we sent, I sent you that paper. Yes, that's how it worked. And so we were, this is science in the making because it's quite unlikely that this species of isopod has ever been described from British Columbia. Um, although this paper here is from Washington State, which is, which is also tertiary and late Eocene. And we are kind of in late Eocene. It might be the same, but we compared to the isopods in this paper. And I counted on this. Um, this is a tail section, by the way. I, sorry, I didn't say that. This is the tail section. I counted like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, about, I don't know, maybe 15 little spines on this isopod. So not being a professional, not being an expert, that that's a characteristic you can understand and write down. So here is part of the paper. Now, this is a, a artist a, a rendition of an isopod from the, sorry, from the uh, tertiary in Washington state. So how many little points do we have here? Little, we only have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Quite a few less. So um, this is uh, this is called a uh, allison uh, or tail, uh, and it's uh, it's ideable. And this is how you'd be able to determine or one of the characters to be able to determine what you had. Now here's some of those specimens here. You can see there's not that many of the spines there or on this one here. However, there's, I think there's presently, there's over 5,000 different species of marine isopods. So they're quite plentiful in the ocean, but we don't know what this one is yet. Now, Tori, I understand is gonna do a, a paper on it when he gets time. So what is an isopod? Are they around today? Well, yes, they are. So here's an example of an isopod that's actually living today. This is a, a real photograph of an isopod. This is what he looks like his frontal view, really cute looking. Uh, you wouldn't wanna be uh, attacked by a, a giant one of these isopods, um, but they're uh, what's called detrividors. They are bottom, eaters, they eat all dead things, all rotten things, anything in the bottom of the ocean, they will eat. And, and uh, so 
Uh, we point out this is a tail section of a modern isopod. It's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. A fair number more than the paper had and more similar to what, what we found. But again, um, we don't know. Now, just for uh, Kate who wanted to learn about things, um, an isopod is an arthropod, which is a, has an exoskeleton. Um, but this one here is, is quite different because these exoskeletons are segmented and they can move. They actually have overlapping features and they can curl up into a ball for protection, to protect their underbody. So um, they're pretty cool little uh, animals and they breathe with gills. So everybody, when you have time later on, Google isopod, go Wikipedia and you'll learn all about isopods. And um, uh, yeah. So um, can I ask a question? Yeah. On the West Coast, I've seen the most peculiar, very similar animals with, yep. they don't have 14 ridges, they have 10, but they're brown and they're really small and they curve up. What are, are those isopods or? Yep, they're, they're, they are, a, they're, a, now the ones you see that are brown are on the rocks, right? Like they're quite big and they're okay. on the, on the rocks and, and when you see them, they're, they're always in the, intertidal area moving in and out with the tide yeah those are isopods those are modern day isopods and that's so chitons? A, oh there's chitons as well okay but but chitons stick they actually stick to the rock is that what you're thinking that's jerry here i've, I've seen chitons before i was wondering if that's what you're describing no no the, the chitons are are completely different again um but the isopods i think that kate was referring to are they look like a, a big, what we call a sow bug or a wood bug. And uh, again, they're related to this isopod. So, anyways, a little bit of science for you to go home and, and uh, read, read more about it. Okay, back to our trip. Um, and again, this is First Creek when we first left our camp and the, the sculpting of the ocean and the rocks was absolutely a photographer's dream uh, to see the uh, the way Mother Nature has carving out the West Coast. And I think, Kate, you said, how come there's so many strange rock formations? Well, it's because of the erosion. Um, here's another area. You can see the bedding planes from the sedimentary rock, right? This is the bedding plane tipped up. And then you look closely, and what do you see right here? What do you see right here, right here, over here? Anybody know what those are? Concretions, concretions that have fossils in them. But we had, we weren't interested. <laughs> but we did get going on it. And uh, this was the first day. Uh, and this is when um, Amy found her fossil cone and uh, which is significant and it will be uh, set up for study as well. Uh, another rock formation, again, you look closely, what's that? Concretion, 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 concretion. Again, we didn't dig these out because there are so many and we were exhausted, but uh, that's what we, that's where we're, we're hanging out and this, this sediment here is a little bit different than, this is more like sandstone or gritty sandstone, whereas further down, it's more like shale. Of course, there's huge waves coming in all the time. Um, this is, some, again, these waves are even higher than where we were, were collecting sometimes. But um, at one point, a wave came right over and got us wet. There's James um, looking for fossils. No, he's actually probably looking, uh, studying where our camp was, looking back at our camp. And then we come back to camp. And this is kind of, I'm getting toward the end of the presentation here. I hope everybody's still awake. 
Um, uh, there's John. We're packing up uh, at the end of our trip and we're ready to head back. And uh, John is extremely uh, overweight, probably 60 pounds, I would guess. Um, and I don't know how he did it, but he did. Um, and away we go on our hike out. Um, that's myself and John uh, having a little rest along the way. Um, we hit, get out to uh, um, Louis Lagoon and Louis Inlet, and we're hiking out. Um, this is a rock cairn that we put up here so we wouldn't get lost. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we're heavily, heavily packed. Come out back to the boat wrecks. Again, the tide is high, so we're basically walking through the water up to our knees at this point to get back. There's no shoreline. There's Amy. Uh, John, John and Amy and I stuck out together. The other guys came back a little bit sooner than us, probably by a couple of hours, and they didn't have to walk in the water. And there's John. He's hanging in there. <laughs> And we're back to camp. Well, we were so happy to get back to camp because we had hidden a case of beer in a tote in the shade. And we were able to have a little refreshment as we got back to the, the Bible camp. And we lit the fire there and we had a, a lots of fun that evening. There's our group, we're pretty tired. There's James, Betty, Charity, Patty, Mike, and John. Uh, of course, we were soaked uh, and we got the fire going and started to, uh, to dry out our shoes. Um, and we're having a refreshing cocktail there before supper. And we met a couple of native guys who were hanging out at the camp and uh, they were lots of fun. And we, then we sat around the campfire and told stories about our trip. And we set up camp, that, of course, and we slept the night. And uh, then the boat arrived, and away we go, and we head back to Tassus. And uh, a little side story here. Um, the two native guys, had picked up a dog in uh, in Zabalas, um, and they had it with them, and they weren't treating it very well because he was so sad and lonely, um, and they didn't really want it. So Charity asked them, you know, what is this their dog? They said no. Well, whose dog is it? Oh, we don't know. Um, and so Charity said, would you mind if I took care of this dog and took it back home with me? And they said, no problem, take it. So that was a, a story that started. Um, and Charity, you can maybe add a little bit to and, and, and tell them how it got named and things like that. Uh, they had named the dog um, Killer Whale in New Chaplet, but I didn't remember what, what it was. Uh, what that name was, and we ended up calling him Nutka, and he's uh, the VIPS mascot now. <laughs> he's super shiny, healthy, and happy, and uh, full of energy. So he's having a great life. That's awesome, Jerry. That's a, such a such a good story. I love it, and and thank you for being so generous to to do that. And yeah, I did I did see the pictures you sent me. Thank you for sending them. And he, as, as Charity said, he is very healthy and a great companion. Um, yeah, that was true. That was truly a dog rescue by Charity. Um, you know, that dog was uh, was in, uh, you know, not the roughest physical shape, but emotionally, he was a very sad dog. A puppy does not just lie on the ground, you know, and not acknowledge people there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good for you, Charity. Yeah. Thanks, but thanks for your help, Patty. You did yeah. all. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, a, a great story. Again, it's not just about fossils, it's about people, it's about dogs, it's about bears and wolves and all kinds of things and hiking. So um, this was a, 
what we call an epic trip. It could be a one in a lifetime trip for, for some people. And I just wanna thank the members of the VIPS uh, for another great paleo adventure. And, and photo credits went to Amy O'Reilly, Betty Franklin and myself. And uh, thanks for um, making that all work out good. And I'm, that's the end of the show. So if anybody has any questions uh, of myself or John or uh, Charity or um, um, you can ask them, go ahead and ask them. James yeah. is here too. And James, yes, James. Hi, 